it was the worst experience of my life. More terrible even than watching my wife die of cancer. I am ashamed to admit that my depression felt worse than her death, but it's true. I was in a state that bears no resemblance to anything I had experienced before. It was not just feeling very low, depressed in the commonly used sense of the word, I was seriously ill. I was totally self-involved, negative and thought about suicide most of the time. I could not think properly, let alone work, and wanted to remain curled up in bed all day. I could not ride my bicycle or go out on my own. I had panic attacks if left alone, and there were numerous physical symptoms. My whole skin would seem to be on fire and I developed uncontrollable twitches. Every new physical sign caused extreme anxiety. I was terrified, for example, that I would be unable to urinate. Sleep was impossible without sleeping pills. These only worked for a few hours and when I woke up I felt worse. The future was hopeless. I was convinced that I would never work again or recover. There was the strong fear that I might go mad. I had never been seriously depressed before. On previous occasions the way I dealt with mild depressions, feeling low, was to go jogging. Inquiry among my fellow joggers confirmed my view that we do not exercise for health but to avoid mild depression. The widely held belief that exercise raises endorphin levels and so provides an uplifting mood turns out to be based on a quite reasonable scientific evidence. I then rather sneeringly proclaimed that I believed in the SOC school of psychiatry, just put them up when feeling low, but that certainly does not work with serious depression. If you can describe your depression, you almost certainly have not truly experienced it. Until one has experienced a debilitating severe depression, it is hard to understand the feelings of those who have it. Severe depression borders on being beyond description. It is not just feeling much lower than usual. It is a quite different state. A state that bears only tangential resemblance to normal emotion. It deserves some new and special word of its own. A word that would somehow encapsulate both the pain and the conviction that no remedy will ever come. We certainly could do with a better word for this illness than one with the mere common connotation of being down. Major or severe depression also known as a clinical depression because it is disabling, should be distinguished from milder depressed mood. For some sufferers, the main feeling is an overwhelming sadness which can be accompanied by numbness, dullness and apathy. Thoughts of suicide are common, as are crying spells, yet others can become very irritable, even angry. Difficulties with sleeping are common too, as are fatigue and the lack of energy. In severe cases, the patient can hardly move and is almost comatose and may experience hallucinations and delusions. Almost always there is also an inability to concentrate for long or to make decisions. There may be a general feeling of hopelessness coupled with a loss of self-esteem. Often anxiety is the dominant emotion and this may lead to hypochondria, excessive worries about one's health, each apparently abnormal bodily symptom being interpreted as evidence of a major illness. A characteristic feature of depression is the loss of interest or pleasure in almost all activities. Even when something good happens, the depressed mood does not improve. It is also characteristic that the depression is worst in the morning and associated with early morning awakenings. 
The terms melancholy and depression are closely related, and melancholy is the term that was usually used to describe the condition until quite recently. But while the term depression to describe a mental condition is often thought of as having a modern origin, it was actually used in 1665 in Baker's Chronicle, which referred to someone having a great depression of spirit. It is also used in a similar sense by Samuel Johnson in 1753, and George Eliot in Daniel de Ronda writes, he found her in a state of deep depression. Yet as William Styron so brilliantly puts it, depression is a word that has slithered through the language like a slug, leaving little trace of its intrinsic malevolence and preventing, by its very insipidity, a general awareness of the horrible intensity of the disease when out of control. The clinical features of depression are well described by one of the pioneers of its study, the German psychiatrist Emil Kraplin, writing in 1921. He feels solitary, indescribably unhappy, as a creature disinherited of fate. He is skeptical about God, and with a certain dull submission, which shuts out every comfort and every gleam of light. He drags himself with difficulty from one day to another. Everything has become disagreeable to him. Everything wearies him. Company, music, travel, his professional work. Everywhere he sees only the dark side and difficulties. The people around him are not so good and unselfish as he thought. One disappointment and disillusionment follows another. Life appears to him to be aimless. He thinks that he is superfluous to the world. He cannot concentrate himself any longer. The thought occurs to him to take his life without knowing why. He has a feeling as if something has cracked in him. There is nevertheless something absurd about the depressive state for the feelings and thoughts of the depressive can bear so little relation to reality. Some of these almost ridiculous features are described by the writer Andrew Solomon in an article for the New Yorker. He describes lying in bed too frightened to take a shower, while he could mentally rehearse all the steps that were required to get him to the shower. They became like fourteen steps as painful and difficult as the Stations of the Cross. Even though he knew that he had effortlessly showered every day for years, he now hoped that someone else would open the bathroom door. It all seemed so idiotic and hopeless, particularly as he had done skydiving, and it seemed that it had been easier to make his way toward the tip of a plane's wing against a powerful wind at 6,000 feet than it was now to get out of bed and take a shower. No wonder that he wept. If he had a soul, and as a hardline materialist I do not believe we do, a useful metaphor for depression could be so loss due to extreme sadness. The body and mind emptied of the soul lose interest in almost everything except themselves. The idea of the wandering soul is widely accepted across numerous cultures and the adjective empty is viewed across most cultures as negative. The metaphor captures the way in which we experience our own existence. Our soul is our inner essence, something distinctly different from the hard material world in which we live. Lose it and we are depressed, cut off, alone. Depression, or melancholy as it was known, has a long history, probably as long as that of Homo sapiens itself, and there are descriptions going back to the earliest literature. It is present in the Bible. Listen to Job's despair. Why is light given to those in misery, and life to the bitter of soul, to those who long for death that does not come? 
who search for it more than for hidden treasure, who are filled with gladness and rejoice when they reach the grave. It was, and still is, common in various cultures to attribute the cause of mental illness to a supernatural agent. In ancient Greece, it was believed that mental illness could be inflicted by the gods as a punishment for some misdeed. In early Christian times, it was sometimes considered to be a test of the faithful sent by the devil. Melancholia as a distinct medical condition was, however, already recognized in Greece in the 4th century BC in the Hippocratic writings. It was associated with aversion to food, despondency, irritability and restlessness, and fear. The leading authority on medical conditions in the 2nd century BC was Galen, whose humoral theory lasted for centuries to come. The explanation for the condition was in terms of an imbalance of the four Galenic humors, blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm, that were thought to govern human well-being and illness. Melancholia was thought to be due to an excess of black bile. Galen's description of the condition has a contemporary ring, although each melancholic patient acts quite differently than the others, all of them seem to be filled with fear or despondency. They find fault with life and hate people, but not all want to die. Others again will appear to you quite bizarre because they dread death and desire to die at the same time. It is somewhat ironic that in earlier times there was not always the stigma attached to depression that there is today and that the melancholic thought of himself as a rather superior being. For Aristotle, melancholy was the temperament of the creative artist, for creativity was thought to be driven by black bile. Aristotle had an influence on attitudes to melancholy that lasted for centuries, since he asked why it was that those who became eminent in philosophy, politics, poetry, or the arts, as well as many of the great Greek heroes, were of a melancholic temperament. He included among these Plato and Socrates. There could be, he suggested, a touch of mad genius in melancholia, and so melancholy was an inviolable condition of the mind. By the late 4th century, the Christian church was using the term to refer to weariness or distress of the heart a condition that was regarded as undesirable and requiring treatment. While initially associated with sadness, it later became associated with the sin of sloth and known as axidy. Axidy in the 1300s was listed by the church as a cardinal sin for it made, for example, monks lazy and sluggish. For Saint Thomas Aquinas, Axity was the result of shrinking from doing some good, but the concept of axity is more complex than that, an interpretation vary. Some commentators related the origin of black bile to Adam's eating of the forbidden apple. With the weakening of the power of the Christian church in the 15th and 16th centuries, axity became more and more associated with melancholia. An Arabic medical writer in Baghdad in the early 10th century wrote a treatise on melancholia claiming that black bile was its immediate cause. His definition of the illness is striking. A certain feeling of dejection and isolation which forms in the soul because of something that the patients think is real but which is in fact unreal. He describes those afflicted as sunk in an irrational constant sadness and dejection, in an anxiety and brooding. He attributed mental overexertion as a major cause of the condition, but also recognized the role of bereavement and loss of possessions.